If I'm there a few times a week, I'm getting things done. But even if I'm not in the studio, like I'm thinking about paintings that I have waiting for me. Welcome to the Creators here at Sum City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by making creators. Art, making what you make. Today on The Creators, it's visual artist Bree Custer, who is a painter in oil and watercolors, as well as recent collages with cut paper and paint. Bree has been catching fire on the seacoast and broader art scene, both in galleries as well as in the media. So we invite you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Well, you got to watch the show first. So here's Tommy. Hi, folks. Welcome back to The Creators. Coming to you from Sun City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. And with us today on The Creators, we have a very special guest uh, and, uh, of course, artist uh, extraordinaire. Uh, Brie Custer is uh, visiting with us today. And uh, welcome to The Creators. Thanks, Tom. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you, too. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. There's a sort of UNH connection there uh, going back. Um, and but uh, since you know, since you uh, graced the halls of uh, Horton Horton Hall, uh, you've gone on to do a number of different things, and we want to get into uh, to those particularly uh, art related. Um, but first of all, you know, the show's called The Creators, and uh, that's a kind of creator has become a, a kind of popular term um, for artists of various types, mm -hmm. you know, sort of content creators, but other types of art as well. Um, do you consider yourself a creator? And, you know, whatever your answer to that is, what, what do you, you know, what does that term mean to you? Yeah, um, I would say absolutely. And I feel like I try and um, own that, but also because I think I try and encourage other people if they don't identify as a traditional artist. Like, I think everybody kind of has that part of them to create something. Um, but I, I think that I've always had, that's been a really strong part of my personality since I was little, whether it was with crayons or um, like Play-Doh, I don't know. Just growing up, that was always sort of a constant interest for me. So. Um, and it kind of keeps me grounded, and it's a, it's just an important part of what I do every day. I think. Yeah. So, I, I'm sure that a number of those crayon <laughs> works and, and so on wound up, uh, you know, on refrigerators and, and things like that sure. as you were growing up. Um, but uh, let let's jump to uh, where things started to get maybe a little bit more formal in terms yeah. of your training. Yeah. Um, you know, when when did you kind of have that realization that this was something that you wanted to really make a part of your life from now okay. on? Yeah, I so I came to UNH. I am from New Hampshire originally, um, and I came to UNH wanting to do art. Um, and I was in the program, and I think it just I got even more inspired by the people that I was working with, and. I was always very studious and so being in a classroom where like my main goal was creating um, was just a really good situation for me um, and a good fit for my major. And I think it, it did say, take some time for me to figure out exactly um, what kind of art I was supposed to be making. Um, you know, and I think that that's a struggle for everybody when, you know, they know that they want to make art but they don't know what kind of art that they want to make. Um, and so I did school and as I'm going through and becoming a senior, I start to look past college and realize that it's not going to be that simple um, as far as just like making art because you have to pay the bills in some way. <laughs> and yeah. so I ended up getting a job at UNH and I was there and I continued to paint on the side while I worked um, in the communication department and then later in the registrar's office. So art was happening on the side, but it did take a back seat for me for a little while. Um, I started my master's degree um, part-time and um, it really, almost for a couple of years, became like I was not making art. 
and it stressed me out a lot. Um, and so this past year, I, I decided that I missed it and that it was bad for me not to be making. I was stressed out and I had a lot of anxiety. And so I had to, I had to decide to dedicate time to it or else it wasn't going to happen. Nobody else was going to do it for me. And so this year I like set up a studio space in my basement. It has awful light and um, it's crowded, but it works and it's a space that I can go and, and make things. And so I just having that space and having the decision that that was going to be important for me, um, has really allowed me to grow and like reignite that this past year. Um, and so that's kind of where I am right now and just making in, whether it's in a sketchbook in like a free 20 minute period or um, being in the studio on the weekend for a five hour day, um, you know, you just, it's a commitment a little bit. And so I guess back to your question about like, do you call yourself a creator? I think like, for me, I felt like I had lost that identity for a couple of years after school when I didn't have like the, the solid studio practice. And so like, especially in the last year getting back into it, I feel like I can like re-own that word for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I didn't go too That's, far, if you're no, too I, far off of I, that. I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, um, have been able to find your way back, yeah. you know, to, to having the time or making the time to create. Um, Cause that's a story that, you know, uh, I've talked to lots of artists of various types and they go through that. And, you know, different people have different ways of trying to, to make it back to that place, yeah. you know, and some people don't, unfortunately. Um, so I'm really glad to, to hear that you have been able to do that. And uh, I know that you've had um, a, a significant amount of success in terms of you've got some uh, exhibits that you've uh, shown your art at and you've got some coming up and can you talk, tell us a little bit about some of the highlights from those? Sure. Um, so I guess starting this um, this past summer I had a really great opportunity um, to show at the Sprinkler Factor in Worcester, Mass. And um, it was great because it was a larger body of work that I needed to give them. It was 15 paintings, oil paintings. and. So I had some of them made, but um, some of them, you know, hadn't been made yet. And so it really pushed that practice of like, I had a goal that I needed to meet um, and sold some paintings in that show, which was a huge confident boost. And I got to meet a lot of other great artists in that opportunity. So that's kind of the biggest thing that happened this year. Um, and then I have another one that I am going to later tonight um, at Main Street Art. And that is a small work show for the holiday season with more local artists. Um, and I'm pretty excited about that one. And that one is uh, three watercolor paintings. That is sort of a smaller part of my practice, but it's good for the small work show. And the third really exciting thing that's happened in this past year is uh, a publication, Portsmouth Magazine. They're on their second issue and currently accepting submissions for their third, but they are out of Portsmouth and publish local artists artwork in this beautiful journal no advertisements and I ended up getting the cover spot of that for issue two which I was just like blown away by it I wow. you know I submitted to this call it was an open call for submission and uh Mark at Plain Spoke is the one that reviews them and I it had been like four months of review and I just figured I wasn't accepted into the journal and then got the email and literally jumped up and down. Um, and it's, I, it's something I'm really proud of. And it's just another thing that, you know, when things like that happen, when you get a yes, it just propels you forward um, because there are also a lot of like rejections that come when you're applying for shows and trying to find the right match with the right people. So. Those things are so important. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, and again, I think that, that's a great story, you know, to kind of, this is what has happened since you yeah. came out of that period when you were wondering, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're going to be able to really continue. Um, and there's a number of people who have been on the show 
artists of various types who also have had a parallel career in teaching. And I understand that mm -hmm. you're, you're sort of heading in that direction as well right yeah. now. Right. Yeah, so um, I mentioned that I started my master's when I was at UNH, um, sort of finishing my class coursework part-time for my um, master's in education. And so right now I'm in almost at the center of my internship year where because I am going to be certified K through 12, I have to have one semester in an elementary setting and another semester in a secondary setting. And so I'm working full-time in an art classroom right now um, at Deerfield Community School and I love it. It is the hardest job I've ever done. <laughs> it's really difficult uh -huh. um, and it's really emotional and it's like highs and lows all the time and really fast-paced and um, I'm learning a lot very quickly and and it's something too where I feel like I get a lot of fulfillment and inspiration from the things that the kids are doing. They come up with this stuff that is just, you know, ridiculous on one end, but brilliant on the other. They can really come up with, as you, as you put it, mm -hmm. some really brilliant stuff. And they don't, they don't realize it at that point. And no. they're always, you know, a lot. I mean, the, the younger grades are confident in what they're doing. Um, but as soon as like, I think around the fourth to fifth grade and then eighth grade and seventh grade it's really tough is that like there's a lot of self-criticism and mm -hmm. like it's not cool to be confident in it and um I that's the biggest struggle like they know like they can learn the art stuff but it's trying to convince them that they have the ability to to make art um, or that they can identify as an artist and they don't believe me when I tell them because they're a lot of them If I'm like that is so great Like look at the way that you use that color and they'll just tell me that they'll be like you have to say that you don't mean that You have to <laughs> tell us huh. so um, hmm. It's really difficult, but um, No, there are some pieces of art that they make and that comes out of those classrooms when they really put their mind to it That is just beautiful and and thoughtful yeah um and thought provoking right? yeah 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 um i want to get back to uh things related to your artwork particularly sure. like style and process and things okay. like that but uh, i want to start that <laughs> part of the conversation by going back to your school days yeah um was there can you pinpoint any sort of maybe like one moment where someone, you know, gave you some uh, positive feedback that really uh, that really reached you, or you know, uh, mm -hmm. a particular moment where you were just kind of like, okay, this this is what I really want to do. Yeah, um, I was a total suck up, like teacher's pet. <laughs> so, <laughs> like I I you know I never had a really huge soul crushing experience in art like I think some people do like if they have a rough um time or they don't align with a faculty member mm. but that to me it um that was a tough thing for me as well because I wasn't necessarily finding my own voice I was doing what I needed to to get a good grade or to try and do what I thought my professor wanted to see um but then I had a, a professor, Rick Fox, who I think what he was teaching resonated with me a lot and, and I identified it and it was a lot of color theory in the classroom at first when we started and um, really breaking down what you're looking at into different shapes and focus on observation um, and just how we can take what we see and actually change it. And so that kind of for the first time felt to me like, oh, I think I might have found something that is what I'm really interested in. And then um, I ended up studying abroad the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And that is really the first time I got to paint in plein air um, outside for, you know, and really get into it. And he was one of the faculty members that went on that trip. And so and I was with peers that were also going through the same thing from UNH. And it was just a wonderful experience. And we were in, we were in Italy, so the colors mm. and the light, you know, was just, you can't get that here. Yeah. 
<laughs> and and so to be able to learn from that experience, it's just like a, an addicting experience to be able to like observe something and then put it on a canvas in your own way. Um, and, and to learn how to really see color, which sounds weird, but um, not just local color. Like if something is blue and you know it's blue, there are also like purple shadows in it or, you know, there's a yellow highlight. Um, and so once you learn how to do that, you're going to see it everywhere. And that is something that has never, even in, in really simple work that I'm doing, I'm always thinking about that and those lessons that I learned. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that was sort of the biggest turning point and the biggest hook for me of like, oh, this is what I want to do. Um, and I think about it all the time, totally obsessed with it. <laughs> so. <laughs> um. <clears throat> So I've seen some of the things, the, some examples of your artwork yeah. that are out online on your Facebook sure. uh, page and, and other um, sites. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about where people can go to um, yeah. to take a look at that in just a minute. But rather than, than me sort of trying to describe your style, okay. how, how do you describe your style of, of much of your work? Yeah, it's hard for an artist, <laughs> I think, to do that because there's a lot of thought going on. But um, I think... I'm not a perfectionist is sort of um, a really main part of my work. And so it's very expressive. Um, and I'm really interested in how we as humans like perceive the world. And, and in my paintings, I want to give an impression or a feeling of something, um, but not necessarily paint it how you think that it looks or how it, it you know, it, if I wanted that, I would just take a picture. Mm. So, um, you know, that's a big part of it. And my recent work, I've been doing these paper cuts. Um, so normally I work mainly in oils, but I've been taking these um, piece small, they're little pieces of paper and an X-Acto knife and cutting out the negative spaces that you would see like in trees against a sky. And um, so working with those positive negative shapes that I was observing in my paintings, um, but to try and incorporate a different medium into my work. And I feel like working between media is really important to me because it is keeping things really, really fresh and challenging how I can communicate what I'm seeing or what I'm thinking about in a limited medium. So like with paper cutting, like I'm not going to be able to show you color and all of that stuff. Um, and so it's a challenge. And then going back to an oil painting after doing one of those, you know, you see it a little bit differently or I'm thinking about the shapes differently. Um, and so it's important to keep things really fresh and explore different areas of of art, I guess. Yeah. I um, what would you say, is there kind of a, maybe like a foundational or a sort of cornerstone in abstract art, though, that influences yeah, your work? Yeah, I think so. And especially, like, abstract expressionism, um, to me, is really important. And, like, I get really excited if I, you know, if there's a Matisse exhibit or, um, like, de Kooning or... Um, Diebenkorn, Richard Diebenkorn, I love. Um, so just like these really bright colors and things that are recognizable, I think is important and I'm interested in. And, um, you know, I'm still working from observation, but translating them into a, a different type of, of language, a visual language. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you were, you were saying a minute ago that if, if you wanted total realism, you could just go and take a picture. <laughs> And that reminded me of, uh, you know, uh, an art history class that I had years ago as an undergraduate, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw, when we started to learn more about Picasso, who, yeah. you know, I'm coming to that class with somewhat of a knowledge of, of some of Picasso's work. And, but it was more once he had gotten into Cubism and, and mm -hmm. on and on from there. And the first thing that the teacher showed us was uh, it was either a pen and ink or maybe even a charcoal yeah. of a man standing there, and it looked like a black and white photograph. Uh -huh. It was so completely perfect and detailed. Yeah. Um, and it was also kind of a, 
a revelation for me that the, here's this artist that went on to become, you know, like <laughs> the mm -hmm. arguably the most famous artist, certainly at least of his time, yeah. and revolutionary in the style changes that he made along the way. But he was capable of doing this this black and white that was, you know, looked like a photo. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, he made the same kind of choices in, in terms of that wasn't what he wanted to do. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, and I think too, you'll find a lot of like abstract artists will are still drawing, and yeah. you don't get to see that part of what they're doing in their studio, um, and that's probably what was going on with Picasso. Is like he's still studying things and he's still drawing. Yeah, um, that was when he was sixteen that he drew this. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, so. How about uh, your process? You know, yeah. it, with all of the different artists that we have here, some of them are very disciplined. Some mm -hmm. rely pretty much on inspiration whenever that strikes. Yeah. And you've got your studio that you mentioned, the, the basement poorly mm -hmm. lit studio. <laughs> uh, how, yeah. especially with, with how much energy uh, I know that the teaching yeah. takes, uh, how is that going in terms of your discipline and, and your process? Sure. Um, it's hard sometimes, especially like if things, you know, if you get an invite to like something social or there's family things on the weekends to have to carve that time out. But I'm trying to be in the studio at least like a few times a week and definitely on the weekends if I'm home, um, I've got to be there. And, but I don't schedule a formal time because I think for me that is too structured and I would get in there and, you know, I think it's important to show up and be there and do something. Um, but I need to be in the right mindset or else it's not going to happen for me. And other artists are different. But uh, even if I, like, if I'm there a few times a week, I'm getting things done. But even if I'm not in the studio, like, I'm thinking about paintings that I have waiting for me and um, of like new directions to go in. And so a lot of it is is thinking right now and if I have a plan period at school, I'm thinking about my work. And so even though I don't schedule it formally, by the time I have a moment to get in the studio, because it's so limited right now, I'm usually ready, like I'm eager and I think about it and I can't wait. Um, so it kind of happens organically, I would say, if that makes sense. Um, and even just, I'm not, at, I'm organized in other areas of my life, but my studio is not. And the chaos, I think, helps feed that a little bit because there's always, if I have multiple projects going on, um, there's always something that I can get into, I guess. Um, and especially when I have different media going, whether it's watercolor, oil, um, or those paper cuts, you know, I'm going back and forth between them. Um, and the, the paper cuts and the smaller works serve as those things that I can do on days where I don't have like multiple hours to spend in the studio, but I can work smaller, whether it's like if, you know, I'm on the couch watching TV, I can work on those at the same time. Um, so it's, that's a bit of a compromise between them. Um, because sometimes it's, I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Teaching can uh, can make you feel that way sometimes. Yeah, I guess. yeah. Um, so where can people go to uh, besides the exhibits and, and sure. that sort of thing? But online, where can people take a look at your work and you know yeah. maybe even buy some of it? Yeah, I have um, my website. So I have my portfolio, my shop up. It's um, briecuster.com, um, B R I. And then c u s t e r dot com, and then um, I'm really active on Instagram as well. So that's at Brie with five eyes Custer, <laughs> um, and so like just for like updates and process and um, upcoming shows, that is you know oh, pretty much always up to date too. So great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on The Creators. Brie Custer uh, is a local artist, uh, painter extraordinaire, and also working in the, the paper <laughs> cuts. 
um, as well and uh, encourage people to go out and see her work uh, at exhibits and so on and definitely visit the website as well. Um, you know, supporting local art is a really important thing to do and uh, hope that uh, people will consider that. Um, that wraps it up for uh, this episode of The Creators, coming to you as usual from Sun City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. Subscribe if you haven't already, and uh, give us a thumbs up if you're so willing. Uh, you know, pass the show around uh, online too. That is uh, a great help, and not only to, to the show, but also to the artists we bring in here to talk with us. Um, so thanks, and we'll see you next time.